Uh, so also today we're wrapping up our uh, series that we've been doing on family and the marriage. And uh, the title of the message today is Let It Go. And I want to talk to you this morning about the issue of forgiveness. I, I believe one of the greatest areas of struggle that we have is in the area of forgiveness. Let me ask you a question. Has somebody ever done you wrong? Has somebody ever said something or done something to you that was completely undeserved? And to make matters worse, they, they didn't apologize. They didn't try and make it right. They, 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 they didn't try to seek some type of restitution with you. And you were left with, with, a, with a stain on your soul. You were left with some unbelievable hurt and pain in your life. Yeah, we've all been through times like that, haven't we? And, uh, you know, it's like you see a, a name that pops up in your inbox and you cringe. You're having a great day on the outside, but all of a sudden you see the name pop up and on the inside you're doing this. Or maybe you're driving around the neighborhood and you see that, that, that person that offended you and hurt you and you're, you're making that same face as you see that person. You know, it's just that gnawing uneasiness in your own spirit and in your own life. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? I believe perhaps the greatest place where forgiveness needs to take place is not in the community and not in the neighborhood. It's in the home. When you're crossways with the folks in your home, with your spouse, you have to see them every single day. You got to sleep in the same bed. You got to eat dinner at the same table. You got to park in the same garage. So the greatest place of forgiveness and where forgiveness really begins is in the home. It's, it's between that husband and between that wife and the wife and the husband. And listen, when mom and dad are getting along and forgiving each other, it builds a foundation for the entire family to thrive. It builds that culture where kids can thrive and parents can thrive. And man, I want that so bad for our church and for our, for our community is that we would have homes that are places of positivity, places of encouragement, places of blessing, places of opportunity, and so many other things that God has for us today. I want us to turn in our Bibles to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Uh, the fourth book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter of Ephesians. And you know, forgiveness has many, many positive results. The Mayo Clinic uh, recently published on their website that they have noticed that people who uh, have a forgiving attitude have healthier relationships. They are spiritually and psychologically more well off. They have less anxiety. They have fewer heart problems. They have fewer symptoms of depression. They have better immune systems and they have higher self-esteem. <laughs> That's pretty good motivation, isn't it? To walk and to live in forgiveness. And I think all of us would say amen to all of that. But you know what? There's a spiritual side to that too. Jesus has commanded us to be people of forgiveness. And when we don't forgive others, it gets in the way of our relationship with God, which is, I believe, perhaps the greatest reason why we should walk in forgiveness. The life and the ministry of Jesus was all about forgiveness. Jesus' entire ministry, people were belittling him and putting him down, and Jesus continued to forgive but I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, Ryan, I would love to forgive my husband or my wife, but you don't know who I'm married to. <laughs> you don't know what I've been through. Well, I believe perhaps one of the greatest ways to begin to forgive others is to understand what forgiveness really is. Because there's a lot of confusion about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. Some people think that forgiveness means that you let people walk all over you. And certainly that's not what we're talking about today. Forgiveness is not, for, uh, not that. Um, <clears throat> forgiveness is, it, it, it is not um, letting people take advantage of us. It is not ignoring what has happened to us. It is not acting like, the things that have been done against us really weren't that big of a deal. 
it is not necessarily forgiving. You know, we always hear this phrase, forgive and forget. But if you've been deeply wounded, you probably won't forget. You probably won't. But you can forgive. You can forgive. So forgiveness is not those things, but forgiveness is some other things. It is canceling a debt. Canceling a debt. Forgiveness is an ongoing process. You know, that's why Jesus said to Simon Peter, you got to forgive 70 times 7. That's a lot of forgiveness. I think Jesus knew the wounds that we would endure. He knew how hurt that we would be. And the reason that Jesus said that we had to forgive 70 times 7 is because he knew that some of us would go through certain experiences in our life where we would have to wake up every single day and choose to walk in forgiveness. Forgiveness is not just this one-time deal where we flip a switch and we're like all good. (laughs) We have to walk in forgiveness every day. I know in my own life, sometimes I have to to wake up and I have to re-forgive some people that have wronged me. I have to continue to choose to walk in forgiveness because I'm like everybody else. I can walk in the dark side. (laughs) I can choose to walk in hostility and anger and frustration and, and, and even hatred sometimes if I'm not walking in the Spirit of God. And so we can go back and forth from forgiveness to unforgiveness. We have to choose each day to walk in forgiveness. That's what forgiveness is. It's choosing to cancel the debt. Sometimes we think that forgiveness benefits the other person, but I want you to know today, forgiveness benefits you. It benefits you. It puts you on a right course in your relationship with God. It puts you on a right course in your relationships. It will put you in a right course in your own health. It will put you in a right course in your own uh, sanity and so many other things. And forgiveness is ultimately leaving justice in the hands of God. That's what it is. There's a couple of tests. These are a couple of tests that I think about. Maybe you will too. The revenge test, when you want to get somebody back for what they did. Revenge. That's a test. When we, when we continue to want to get that person back, we're not walking in forgiveness. We're, we're walking in the dark side. We're, we're walking... Um, in unforgiveness rather than forgiveness. And then secondly, the failure test. I mean, has it ever brought you great satisfaction that somebody was really struggling? I I know that it has me. When I walk in unforgiveness, I'm like, they're having a hard time. Yes, they deserve it. Have you ever felt that way before? (laughs) Yes. Love it. That's not forgiveness. That's not walking in forgiveness. So let's look today at how we can let it go. How we can let it go. How can we let go of the hurt and the pain in our own homes and in our own lives? The scripture gives us seven things today. And I want to walk through these things. I normally don't give you guys seven things. But there's just so much good stuff in the word of God that I can't not give it to you. Okay, so here's number one. Number one, you got to bridle your anger. Bridle your anger. Look at, look at the scripture there, 426 Ephesians. In your anger, don't sin. In your anger, don't sin. Is it wrong to be angry? God was angry. Jesus was angry. Read about when Jesus cleared the temple. Is it wrong to be angry? No. The Bible says be, you're going to be angry, but when you're angry, just don't sin. And the problem is, a lot of times, when we get angry, we justify our sin by our anger. But the Bible says, you can be angry, just don't sin. I had a contractor that was doing some work on my house, and he gave me a written you know, commitment. I'm going to charge this much, I'm going to do this work. Guess what? The guy didn't do anything that was on the list. I wanted to kill the guy. <laughs> Left my house a wreck? I was angry. I was mad, but I didn't punch him. I did think about it, okay? I did think about it. Sometimes our anger can lead us down the path of sin. We ought to be angry about the things that God is angry about, but let's don't accompany the righteous anger 
with sinfulness. Be angry, yes. Christians get angry. We should be angry about some things. Absolutely. But don't sin. Be angry, but don't sin. Bridle that anger. Bridle that anger. How do we do that? We resolve conflict immediately. Resolve conflict immediately. How do we keep the bitterness and the hostility and the anger in the home from continuing to escalate and to rise? we got to deal with things in a timely fashion. We have to resolve that conflict immediately. Resolve conflict immediately. And if you look at verse 26, verse uh, B, 26B and 27, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Let it go, the scripture says. Let it go. Resolve conflict immediately. Uh, the Bible says before the sun goes down. That means as soon as possible. <laughs> That's what that means. And, and, and the reason is because our hostilities continue to increase. Uh, many times we deal with hurt and pain by going into denial. We just think, well, I don't want to talk about it. And if I don't talk about it, somehow it will become better. But many times below the surface, the anger continues to increase. It gets worse. And that's why the Bible says, practically speaking, if you want to walk in forgiveness, you need to do so in a timely fashion. You need to do so quickly before it gets out of hand. Before the feud just continues to, 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 to grow and to grow and to, and to grow. And, and, and he says, when we don't do that, we give the devil a foothold in our marriage, in our relationships. We give the devil a foothold. Now, this is kind of a creepy verse right here. All right, the devil has a foothold. What does that mean? A foothold is a firm place to stand. If you've ever done any mountain climbing or rappelling, you know, you, you want to have a firm place to stand. The Bible says, when you have unforgiveness in your heart, you give the devil good footing. You give him some footing right there. You give him a place in the home. You give him a place in the office. You give him a place to stand in your life. Now, to help us understand this, I need a married couple to come up here. Maya and Bailey, you guys come up here real quick. Come on, let's give it up for Maya and Bailey. Okay. <clears throat> you guys come on up here. All right, turn right here. It's a good-looking couple right here. Right here. How long have you guys been married? Uh, just over a year now. Just over a year. Okay, just over a year. So they've been married just over a year. Now, <clears throat> do you think, church, that it would be more strategic for the devil to stand beside the couple, in front of the couple, behind the couple, or in the middle of the couple? How about right here? If I'm the devil, I'm coming here. I want to divide husbands from their wives. And when we have hostility, what happens? We give the devil a firm place to stand to come in and bring division in the home. So the devil is whispering in the ear of the wife. He's whispering in the ear of the husband. He's trying to make both parties feel like that the situation is worse than it really is. And there is no hope. And the way that we give the devil a foothold is because of our own sin. The devil cannot have a foothold in the life of a Christian unless you give it to him. And when we walk in unforgiveness, we give ground to the enemy. We give him a firm place to stand. And so he's pushing Husbands away from wives and wives away from husbands. He's bringing division in the home. So does the devil have a place to stand in your house? Through unforgiveness, have you given him that place of prominence, that place of division? And here's the bigger problem. When the devil has a foothold, a firm place to stand, the devil has a foothold. He has a hold of your foot. He's got a hold of your foot. Watch how this works. Watch how this works. Where's my rope? The devil has a foothold. The devil has a foothold. Look at this. See, when the devil has a foothold, a firm place to stand, he's got a hold of your foot. And when the devil's got a hold of your foot, you got a limp, don't you? A lot of marriages today got a limp. <laughs> a lot of marriages today are off balance, right? Because the devil's got that foothold. He's got that foothold. When you're limping and when you're about to, 
to fall over. Man, you don't have balance in the home. And you got problems. You got problems. So when the devil has a foothold, he has a hold of your foot. And we've got to push him out. We've got to let go of the hostilities that we feel in order that we can walk in freedom. Bailey and Maya, thank you guys so much. Good sports up here today. Thank you for letting me pull your leg. So how do we push the devil's control and influence out of our homes? Uh, chapter 4, verse 22 uh, gives us the first part of that, repent. He says, put off the old person. So we got to turn away from, from our old life. And then in verse 27, he says, resist. In other words, don't give the devil a place. James says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So when the devil starts to kind of push his way in, you push him out. What you do, you, re you repent, you resist, and you renew. And in verse 23 and 24, he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in your spirit of your mind. You know, <laughs> bitterness is so, is so pervasive, is it not? Um, I remember a few years ago when I would have some moldy bread, which wasn't often, but from time to time a little bread would mold. I would just pinch the corner off and throw it away and then eat the bread. Anybody ever done that before? Yeah. And then I was doing some reading, and I learned that the moldy bread, even though it just looks like it's on the surface, all of the mold spores have moved all the way through the bread. Isn't that nasty? I'm like, what have I been eating? I'm contaminated. Ah. <laughs> There's a problem even though it cannot be seen. Sometimes bitterness is that way. It's not out on the surface. It's deep down in our hearts. We got to look at our own hearts today and say, man, God, am I walking with you? Am I... Am I Walking around with unresolved conflict. Is there people that I hate? Am I arguing with my spouse? How, how can I do that? i got to develop some new patterns. Now the Apostle Paul gives uh, uh, some words here in verse 28 that help us to understand walking in freedom and, and walking in, in forgiveness. And, and how we can let it go with, with this in verse 28. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. And so the scripture is basically saying, listen, man, if you used to steal, quit stealing. Break the pattern. There's a lot of bad patterns in the home, bad habits. It's easy to get into bad habits. The way that we talk to our spouse, that's a bad habit. Easy to go there, isn't it? Easy to go there. Being petty about stuff, bad habit, bad habit. Have you ever argued with your spouse about something that didn't even matter? You're like, why are we arguing about it? That's a bad habit. We need some new patterns in the home, amen? Is that right, church? We need some new patterns in the home. We need some, some new rhythms. We need some new patterns. Arguments. Not spending time together. Not communicating. Uh, working too much and not prioritizing the family. These are all bad habits. And Paul says, you got to break the pattern if you're going to walk in unforgiveness and to walk in freedom. And uh, he goes on and he says that we have to also use words carefully. Use words carefully. How can we build a home of forgiveness? How can we build a home that is esteeming and empowering <clears throat> to spouses and children? Look at this in verse 29. Do not rely or do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. It says, don't let, any, don't let any corrupt communication. I used to think that was just cursing. But you know, I started thinking about, there's a lot of corrupt communication that can come out of our mouth that is not just bad language. Sarcasm, corrupt communication, negativity, belittling, Corrupt communication, lying, 
corrupt communication. There's a lot of things. The proverb says the power of the tongue brings life or death. Do you have a home? Do you have a marriage where there is life or where there is death? And what's, what are the words that are being said? There's that old saying, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. That's not true how many, however many times that you may say it. Words are hurtful. Words matter. Words matter a lot. Sarcasm and lying. And, you know, you can hurt people by the tone of your voice. You know? Sometimes it's those hot button issues. You know exactly how to get under the skin of your spouse if I just say this. <laughs> and it may not bother somebody else, but boy, I know it bothers her. <laughs> so what are the words that are being said? We've got to let that go. Let that go. Hey, we want to build a foundation of forgiveness. We need some new patterns, and we need a new rhythm in the home. We need to speak carefully. We need to be sending positive messages, positive messages of, of, of encouragement. And you notice it doesn't say just don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. He says this. He says, look at the latter part here. But only what is helpful for building others up. So our job is not to just not belittle. Our job is to empower and to lift up. Are your words esteeming? Are your words building people up? Are your words giving your spouse more confidence and more encouragement and, 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 and more strength? Or, or, or is it sucking the life out of the home? Genuine compliments. This doesn't mean false flattery or praise, but it means to literally build somebody up. I wonder how different our homes would be if we were focused on constantly building one another up. Let it go. Let it go. Well, how can we build one another up? How is that possible? I mean, if you think about it, in a lot of couples, you have two totally different people. Uh, we were talking about some friends of ours the other day. She is gregarious, outgoing, loved by everyone, driven, successful, charming. And she's married to a guy that literally, he's a great guy, but all he wants to do is crawl in the corner and read a book. And we were saying, how did they end up together? Have you ever thought that? They're both great people. They're totally different. How do two people that are totally different get along? Well, unfortunately, opposites attract, don't they? If you're married today, you probably married somebody who's very different from you. Opposites attract. But we need the Holy Spirit of God to help us. And God has given us a divine power source. Isn't that great? See, all this is possible. You may be like, man, my marriage is over. I don't know how to get along with her. My wife whines all the time. My husband's not sensitive. You know, whatever it may be. I want you to know you have the power of the Holy Spirit at your disposal. And it's no coincidence that the power of the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the context of forgiveness. Because listen, if you're going to forgive those that have wronged you, you need the power of the Spirit of God to do so. It's a supernatural thing. You know what? People who don't know Christ, people that don't have the Spirit of God in their life, this is almost impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And look what the apostle says to us here about relying on the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed under the day of redemption. Now, how do we grieve the Spirit? We sin. How do we sin? We say, I'm not going to forgive her. I would rather hate than forgive. I'd rather be angry. I'd rather be miserable and, 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 and uncomfortable than to let some stuff go. To let it go. We need the Spirit of God. Don't grieve the Spirit. When the Spirit is grieved, He can't empower. The way that we empower the Spirit of God in our life is we walk in the ways of Jesus. We surrender to the Holy Spirit. We say, Holy Spirit, I don't know if I can forgive her. Holy Spirit, I don't know if I can get over what He's done. But Spirit of God, would you empower me to do so? And, and in that moment, the Spirit of God begins to give us new strength and new vitality that we didn't even know that we had. We need the Holy Spirit. 
There's a divine power source. Divine power source. Forgiveness can be very painful, very difficult. Listen, it's hard to forgive, is it not? It's the natural tendency to not forgive. Here's the way our culture says. Love everybody unless they wrong you, and if they wrong you, then hate them. Jesus says something much different. (laughs) Jesus says we even forgive our own enemies. Was Jesus trying to say we just let everybody off the hook? No. Jesus was saying unforgiveness will destroy you. It will destroy your home if you don't deal with that. Some of us are on a second or a third marriage, and you still hate the first person you were married to. And you got unforgiveness towards the first spouse, and now that unforgiveness has been dragged into the new marriage, and the new marriage is struggling. Because it's like mold, man. It just keeps spreading all throughout. we got to deal with it. We gotta, sometimes we think, well, I can hate them, but it won't affect my marriage. But listen, when hate is in your heart, it affects all your relationships. It's all tied together. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. That's what we need. He teaches us. He leads us. He directs us. Listen, God would never ask you to do something that you could not do. Did you know that? I mean, how cruel would that be of God to be like, Man, you need to forgive people, but you're, but you're incapable of doing so, you know. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, I mean, when God made me, he didn't make me Mongolian, you know. I'm an American. I can't be a Mongolian. That's impossible. That's impossible. God says, you know what? It is possible. It is possible to forgive. And that's why I'm going to challenge you to do it. Is it difficult? Of course it is. Is it rewarding? Of course it is. Is it possible because God has given us the great spirit of God in our life? Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. So we got to let it go. How do we let it go? We deal with our junk. We deal with our junk. Look at verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander along with every form of malice. Now he gives a whole list there. We all got our junk. You know, you can kind of circle the one that's more your junk. Anger, brawling, bitterness, rage, whatever it is. Let it go, the Bible says. Let it go. Uh, It's easy to be angry in the home, isn't it? Yelling and screaming, throwing things. Creating a holy tantrum. I mean, that's easy to do that. Um, Slander. It's easy to call your family up. And tell your family how much you hate your spouse. Slander. The Bible says, don't do that. We need some new patterns in the home. Deal with your junk. Deal with that junk. Deal with it. And we all bring some junk into the marriage, but let's don't let the junk dominate us. Let's let the Spirit of God direct us and lead us as we imitate Jesus. The final verse of this beautiful section The apostle reminds us of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The foundation of all forgiveness comes from Christ. Look at it in verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. So when we forgive others, we're imitating Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? How did Jesus forgive us? Unconditionally, graciously, not based on our merits or performance. That's how we have been forgiven in Christ. And now we are to take that forgiveness that God has given to us and we're to pass it on to some other people. Starting in the home. How about that? Listen, you are never more like Jesus Christ than when you choose to forgive. You choose to forgive. The gospel message is the message of forgiveness. John 3:16 says for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, we are forgiven. And when forgiveness has taken root in our life by the message of the gospel, then we can turn around and we can offer that freely and graciously to other people. 
Colossians 2 says, you were dead because of your sins. And because of your sinful nature, he uh, was not cut away. And then God made you alive with Christ. For he forgave all our sins. And he canceled the record of the charges against us. And he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Every time we see the cross, we should think of the great forgiveness of God. And the fact that our sins have been nailed to that cross. That's the beautiful message. That's what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian is not just being religious. Being a Christian is being forgiven. Is what it is. That's why being a Christian is living a life of freedom, not a life of bondage. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're walking in freedom. We're walking. In, and when you live a life of unforgiveness, you will walk in freedom. You will breathe better each morning when you wake up. You'll take a big, deep breath like this. Oh, man, I feel better. It's good. It was hard to let go of that, but I feel better. You know, years ago, some scientists began to study something that um, had never been understood. It was a great mystery uh, in history. Uh, it, they studied the death of Beethoven. Beethoven was the famous composer and musician. And my brother's a concert pianist, and so he used to play Beethoven all the time in the home. And Beethoven was a genius musically, but he died at a young age, and he died in a really unusual way. He had some stomach pains, and, and uh, he began to just... Uh, kind of be irritable and, and depressed and nobody knew what happened to him and the guy just died kind of in the prime of his career. And uh, in 1994, two Americans launched a study to find out what happened to Beethoven. They got a piece of his hair. Now, I don't know how you get a 200-year-old piece of hair, but they got a piece of hair and they did an analysis of it and guess what they discovered? Beethoven died of lead poisoning. They say that in lead poisoning, it's not that you get the lead all at once, but it's a little bit of lead over a long, 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 long period of time. Maybe it was a cup that he drank from that was laced in lead, or maybe it was a p favorite plate that he ate from, or maybe it was some other uh, item around the household that had lead in it. Somehow, some way, his body was exposed to lead over a really long period of time. And in a very unforeseen and unpredictable manner, he lost his life. I think bitterness is a lot like lead poisoning. It's subtle. It's under the surface. It's not detectable. But over a long period of time, it reaps destruction in our lives if we don't. Let it go. If we don't, let it go. God wants us to be people who walk in his freedom and in freedom in all our relationships. Will you pray with me?